Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And if you are new here among us, there's something in the worship service that you won't have to worry about today. That is the passing of the collection plate <laughs> or bucket or whatever it is, right? So some churches, this comes down the aisle, but they have, I don't know if you've seen this before, a stick attached to it. So like you can't take it. And so they pull it back, right? But some churches, I've seen the plate, I've seen the bucket, I've seen the bucket with the holes in the bottom. You don't have to worry about, yeah, that's a real thing. You don't have to worry about that at all. Why? Well, we always kind of look at what we're doing and we say, why are we doing that? Or is it encouraging bad behavior? Or is it making people feel bad? So you could be like the woman with the two copper coins. That's all you had to give, but it doesn't look like you're giving much. We don't want to put anyone on the spot. Maybe you gave online already. So I don't know. You know, so it's not anyone's business. Or it could tempt someone to be like the Pharisee who puts in a large amount of money in front of everyone. So we did away with that. Now, it's not like we don't encourage giving. We're a nonprofit, and clearly we rely on your generosity to do the things that we're doing. It's not the point. We don't want to encourage bad behavior. So it made me think of a story of a young girl who attended a very traditional church where they passed the plate. They didn't have the stick, though. <laughs> so the pastor that day had preached on Romans chapter 12. And so sermon was over. Time for the offering, plate's coming down. Dad puts in the usual amount. As it goes by the girl, she grabs the plate. Well, people were thinking, maybe she's going to put in some change. That's some leftover after buying gum or whatever, right? Can you? Well, anyway. So, so she takes the plate, looks at it, stands up, and starts to walk out. And people are kind of, you ever get stuck? You're in shock, and you're like, what's going on? The mom's like, told you we should have. Right, you know, so, you know, she's going out, but she doesn't go out. She comes right up to the front. She puts the collection, I'm not done, it's just going to get better. She puts, the, she puts the collection plate down on the floor, sits down, takes her shoes off, puts the shoes to the side, stands back up, and stands on the collection plate. You see, Romans 12 says, that we are to make our bodies a living sacrifice. This is the way we worship God. Looked like she got the point. <laughs> All right, I've had funnier ones, but we're going in a different... <laughs> All right, so just to recap, we're sticking with themes. We're trying to put the Bible in chronological-ish order, but I don't want to break from some of these important themes. I'm trying to do large sections of the story so that you can kind of see them, and so they become a little bit more apparent in here. And so we looked at Ezra, Nehemiah. We looked at finding balance. So Nehemiah, the governor, he's very practical. And then he had Ezra, the priest. He's very spiritual. And so there's a time and place for all of those things in our lives. That's where we were. So we kind of closed that theme there. And I showed you, we had a chart. And so this is going to be the same chart as last week. And you're going to see that Esther is in the midst of this. So that's where we were talking about King Xerxes. All right, so Ezra 4, and then Esther, the whole book would have just been right there. She's dealing with King Xerxes at this time. Then Artaxerxes was later, so that's what we were looking at. So we're going to go in the past a bit here and look at the book of Esther. Again, we're trying to look at the whole story. So think of it this way. If you're new, I'm not going to go into it too deep for those of you who've been here. Oh, there he goes on that whole thing again. It's like watching a movie. You want to sit down, you want to watch the whole movie, and then it, you get the whole point, right? You don't want to sit there just watching little snippets of the movie. Not good. So we're going to look at all of Esther. I'm not going to give you every word or detail, all right? So just, just kind of the story here. So let's hop right in. Esther 1.1. 1, 1. These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, so there's your timeline, who reigned over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days, a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. So if we continue here in chapter 1, that's not enough. He's going to have like a seven-day banquet 
with a no drink limit. That's what's going to happen here. It specifically says, there's just no end to the drinking. They're just drinking and drinking and drinking. And he gets to a point where he's like, I'm going to show off my wife, the queen. She's beautiful, Queen Vashti. So he calls for her. Right? So she's going to come in here and look at all my stuff. Look at my woman here. Here's the thing. She refuses the invitation. He's not happy. Right? So he's very, very angry. He asks his officials, like, what do you think we should do? There's a little comedy in here if you're thinking about it because they say, wait a minute, now all our women are going to disobey us too. They're not going to listen to us, so we got to make a decree. So they basically banish her. They say, That's it. No more in the king's presence. You're not going to come in. And then, you know, hey, all the wives, they need to listen to their husbands. So they issue this decree here. And there's, yeah, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> Esther 2, 1. But after Xerxes' anger has, had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. So his personal attendant suggested, let's search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuch, in charge of them, will see that they are all given beauty treatments. After that, the young woman who pleases the king most will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king. Sure it was. So he put the plan into effect. At that time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shimei. His family had been among those who King Jehoiachin of Judah had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. So a couple of important points to notice as we keep reading, if you're going to read this. Esther doesn't tell anybody that she's Jewish. So it makes note of this in here, and that's important. So what happens is they're gathered up. She gains the favor of this Haggai guy, and she, he likes him. They get 12 months of beauty treatments. Sound pretty good, right, ladies? You can go and get 12 months at the spa, special beauty treatments. And so they go through this whole thing, and the longer story made a little bit shorter is that Esther gains an audience with the king. He likes her best. She's really beautiful. He makes her queen. So now she is made queen, and again, she keeps the nationality secret, doesn't tell her husband that she's Jewish. Then there's a very little thing where Mordecai stops a plot. We're going to come back to that later. There are two other people there that want to assassinate the king, and so Mordecai stops it. There's a couple different little variations here on this, but essentially in this one, through Esther, finds out. Mordecai does the king. Good. Esther 3.1, if we turn the page. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, the son of, Ham son of Hamadutha, the Agagite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by, for so the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to bow down or show any respect. Why? And that's what the other people are asking him. Why? Why aren't you doing that? There's no clear answer. But if you know the word really well, the fact that he's an Agagite gives us a little clue. If you know the word really well, and you know one of the reasons Saul, first king of Israel, lost the throne. He was supposed to wipe out King Agag and all his stuff. He doesn't do it. So Samuel ends up killing him. So could be bad blood here between the Jewish people. And we see that this lasts generations and generations. A little clue there as to why, maybe, not said or definitive. So we don't know. So here's the thing. He gets so mad about it that it's not enough to take care of Mordecai alone. He's going to wipe out all the Jewish people. All of them. So he does something that is kind of weird to us today. It says that they're poor, a Purim. He has lost, lots cast. So basically like rolling dice to decide what day this whole thing was going to happen. And then he comes up with the whole thing and approaches the king with it. So it'll be like on our calendar, March 7th-ish. And so they're going to enact this plan on this day. 
kill all the Jewish people. He tries to give the king, it's a massive amount of money. It says, I think, 10,000 talents. So it's about 375 tons of silver. So like a large payoff to get this thing done. He's very invested, clearly, in this whole thing. He just basically says, look, these people are no good, right? So they just worship their God. They don't really obey our laws and stuff, so let's kill them. Let's wipe them out. The king agrees. Here's the signet ring. Go ahead, get it done. Keep your money. Just do your thing. And so this is what happens. Xerxes approves. If you turn the page, Mordecai, Mordecai, he hears about it first. And so, you know, he's doing what the Jewish people would do. You know, he's, he's grieving and mourning. You know, he's showing, he's begging basically God, like, hey, stop this thing from happening. Esther finds out he is, doesn't know why. So she sends him, like, regular clothes. They're not supposed to go in with the sackcloth and stuff like that. He refuses it and then sends word to her as to why he's so upset, tells her about the decree and says, you got to stop it. Makes sense. You're a queen. There's a problem. You're only supposed to gain the audience of the king if he invites you. She hasn't been invited for 30 days. That's a problem. If someone comes in like that, they get killed unless he holds out the gold scepter. That's like the sign that it's all good. So <laughs> Mordecai sends word back, listen, don't think that you're going to escape this destruction. And perhaps maybe you were, you were sent for a time such as this. Like, use the position. So, very important. Here's a real central theme here. Esther 4.15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, day or night. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die... I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. There's your key verse. If I had to pick one verse that is important from this account, that. Esther 5.1, if we turn the page. On the third day of the, fe the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out the gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. Then the king asked her, what do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it is half the kingdom. I'm going to count those. That's one. So here you have that very famous scene, <clears throat> this artwork here. There it is. And Esther replied, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for the king. So the king says, tell Haman, let's go to the banquet. They get there. Now, tell me what you really want, the king says. What is your request? I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. So she says, come with me tomorrow to a banquet I have prepared, and then I'll tell you what it's all about. So Haman leaves, and he's a happy man for several reasons, right? He's getting invited to these exclusive banquets, but... <laughs> He sees Mordecai, and Mordecai is not bowing down to him. So he gets with his family and friends, his wife, Zeresh, and he's bragging about all his accomplishments, how big his family is, his wealth, all his stuff. And by the way, I get invited to these exclusive banquets. Right? So he's bragging about himself, but he says, all this is worth nothing as long as Mordecai the Jew like, basically disrespects me like that. So <laughs> they give him an idea. His wife, Zeresh, and his friends say, set up a sharpened pole 75 feet tall and ask the king to impale Mordecai on it. Ah, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> so he had the pole set up. Segue to, to the king now. Late that night, the king has trouble sleeping. So he has them bring in the book to have it read to him, like the accomplishments of the reign of Xerxes. <clears throat> and so finally, they get to the account of Mordecai and the assassins. Now you may think like, wait a minute, doesn't he know about this? He's a busy guy. So he says, what's been done for Mordecai? What have we given him? He said, nothing. We didn't do anything for Mordecai. So then he sees Haman enters the scene. He says, who's out in the court? That's Haman. Bring Haman in here. And so what's funny is the king doesn't say anything about Mordecai. The king just says, what should be done for someone who honors the king like this? And Haman's thinking, He's thinking about me. So he said, go get the royal robes that the king has worn, and a horse he's ridden on with like an emblem on it. So it's a very fancy thing, right? And then parade that person around the city and say, this 
is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. <laughs> the king says to Haman, excellent, go get Mordecai and you do that for him. <laughs> so he does it, right? So, of course, he's totally embarrassed. He's dejected. He comes home. He complains to his family. His family is like, great, now there's nothing you're going to be able to do to this guy, right? <laughs> So then you, the eunuchs just come and they escort Haman to the banquet. Now we're at the banquet scene again, Esther 7 1. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. On the second occasion, while they were drinking wine, the king asked again to Esther, Tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. And Esther, this is another thing where it's kind of vague. She doesn't talk about the specific decree that they're all worried about. She just says, spare my people, basically. It's really strange. you got to remember that when you're reading it. Very vague, because she's setting something up here. And the king's like, you know, who would, who would do something like this against your people? That wicked Haman. And she points to Haman. So what happens now is the king gets very angry. He leaves the court. Haman's pale with fright. And he goes to plead with Esther, but falls down on the couch she's sitting on. The king comes in, will you even assault the queen? And the servants come along and cover Haman's face, signaling his doom. So then, <laughs> Harbona, this uh, king's eunuch, that's his name, <laughs> he points out the fact that, look, there's a sharpened pole that he was going to execute Mordecai on who saved the king execute Haman on the pole. And so that's what happens. This is the fate. So then the king's anger subsides. Chapter 8. On the same day, King Xerxes gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther. Then Mordecai was brought before the king, for Esther had told the king, finally, how they were related. The king took off his signet ring, which had, he had taken back from Haman and given it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai to be in charge of Haman's property. So the rest of Esther, I'm just going to kind of close it kind of in short here, you see that the king makes a decree. <clears throat> Esther does the gold scepter thing again, and she basically asks for a counter decree. It's kind of interesting. It took me a long time, a few reads through Esther through the years to really understand what's going on here. It's not necessarily a reversal. It might say that, but not necessarily. It's just another decree because he says, once we do this and it has the king's seal on it, we can't reverse it. What the decree gives them permission, that is the Jewish people, is to defend themselves against anybody who might attack them. That's the decree. And they can take plunder, too. There's something noted in there. So let me see if the Jews celebrate. Chapter 9, it finally comes. The day comes, March 7th. And so they, it says that they struck down their enemies with the sword. They annihilated so many people. And they kill 500 people. <laughs> and... Haman's ten sons. This is important. So the king brings Esther in and tells her those facts. What more do you want? <laughs> this is a little comical. She's interesting. She's like, let's do it again tomorrow. <laughs> and those ten dead sons, I want them impaled or hung on the pole. It's not enough that they're dead. We're just going to re-kill them, right, and then put them on display for everybody. So then the next day, the 8th, they go out and do it. And the next day, 300 more people in Susa alone, it says, and the 500 in Susa alone, plus throughout the provinces, 75,000 people are slaughtered. But they did not take any plunder. And it makes note of that. So Purim, this festival, is now established. Esther makes a decree. Chapter 10, it concludes with a very short paragraph basically talking about like the, the glory of Xerxes and Mordecai. It's very, very like poetic and big. Now, here's a few things I want to point out. I'm not going to get into the whole like history of it again and again and again. You can go back to the beginning of the series and watch it if you have some interest in this. But it's worth noting that if you look at the Bible of the early church, it's different, especially the Old Testament. New Testament, not very different. The Old Testament, very different. That's about, go back 350 BD. A couple things about it worth noting. It's all in Greek, even the Old Testament. That's the lingua franca of the day. They're writing the New Testament in Greek. Why would they be doing anything else from the Old Testament except Greek? And so if you look in your Bibles, you'll see a little LXX, LXX, that's the Septuagint. It's telling you that the translators needed to go away from the Hebrew and to the Greek to get some of the prophecies and stuff about Jesus. So it is what it is. And if we go through history, even the 1611 King James Bible is different than the King James Bible today. 
So we're dealing with a bigger Old Testament, 11 to 14 more books. So we don't divide. So what was it like last week I talked about? Like a literal creation. We're not, we're not going to argue about that. You're still a Christian no matter what you believe. Same thing. Some Christians, 60%, view those extra books as scripture. They believe they belong in the Bible. 40% of Christians do not. So it's actually Protestants are in the minority there. So we are a non-denominational church. That means we don't squabble about the secondary things. We keep the gospel at the center, the things about Jesus and salvific or thing, no big word, things that save you. Right? So if you believe things about these other books, you're not unsaved. If you believe in a literal creation or a non-literal creation, saved, saved. Right? So there we go. We don't fight about other stuff. The Bible teaches us that. Don't squabble over those things. So with that being said, it's a different Bible, and it was like that for about 1,500 years-ish of Christianity. It's only recently that this minority group is reading a smaller Old Testament canon. So being that we are a non-denominational church, we look at them, right? And so you can decide on your own whether it's Scripture, but I'm going to point out the pros and cons here of another book. So if you're familiar with these books, another one might come to mind either in similarity or proximity. It's close to where Esther's at. And so I'll show you a couple of things here. If we look there on <laughs> your left, that is the Lexham English Septuagint. That is the Greek uh, version or translation from the Greek. And you see right next to Esther, that blue arrow, arrow there, Judith. There's another book right there. The other one is a 1611 King James Bible, and that is Judith. That's the story of Judith nestled right in there in the King James Bible. So this is an interesting story, and it's a real shame that people don't look at the history of the Bible to know that, hey, your great-granddaddy or whatever it was, man, old you are, you know, it was in his Bible, and they read it. So even if you don't think it's script, that's fine, great. <laughs> but you're culturally missing something. Like, so think about how many other works. You, know, you read the Iliad or something, or you, know, you read this book that everyone's read, but you haven't read something that was in the Bible for 1,500 years. So I really think it's sad when people turn a blind eye to it. And I was showing you with Daniel and Maccabees how it helps you connect a lot of dots. These were in here for a reason. So even if people didn't think they were Scripture, they're in there to educate you about some of the other books. So it's a shame. And so all throughout history, people have known about this. A lot of people don't understand. There's a painting of it in the Sistine Chapel. So Michelangelo, it's right there. Now, once you learn the story, if you don't know it, that's crazy that that's right in the Sistine Chapel. Yes, naked man with head cut off. It's in there. So culturally, it's enriching. Vivaldi, Mozart, they both wrote, wrote songs based on this story. And so people throughout history knew it. So it would be weird, you know, that, that, that you didn't know this story as a Christian going all the way through Christianity. People would be like, huh, what's wrong with you? Don't you know Judith? Now, here's the thing about Judith. I'm going to tell you the story here. It's a slow burn. I think that's what we would say today, maybe like Andor. <laughs> so it's nobody left. Okay. So <clears throat> it's a real slow burn. It takes kind of a while to get there. Not that slow. All right. So, but it's an amazing story. It's a really good, like if they did like a short movie or something, like that, man, it is a really, really, really well-written story. So the first seven chapters, they focus on these military campaigns. You have Nebuchadnezzar and his general, general depending on how you pronounce it, Holofernes, Holofernes. Right? So Nebuchadnezzar, he wants to attack this guy, Arphaxed, Ecbatana is the city. And so he calls on all the other nations to join him in this attack, and then they don't. He wins the attack, takes over the city. Then you're introduced to the general, who then goes on this military campaign, and he's enacting revenge on all the people that didn't help them. So it's like seven chapters of that, pretty detailed through all the things. And there's some interactions with this guy, Achior, regarding the Jewish people. They're going to attack the Jews, and he kind of warns them. I think he's an Ammonite. He warns him, he's like, listen, and he gives us a little history of the Bible. And he tells us, and it's a pretty good summary, whenever they sin, God uses other nations to punish them. When they don't sin, they're, they're kept safe. And so if they're sinning, you'll get them. If they're not, don't, because you can't fight against God. Don't, don't do that. So that's the basic point. Well, he goes in anyway, the general, and he sets up a siege. 
And he's pretty smart. He traps them in there. He cuts off the water supply, and they're starving. Sure enough, <clears throat> 34 days later, I believe it is, they're starving out. The people come to, like, the elders there, Uzziah's name, not the same. Uzziah, just a popular name. And, like, we're starving. That's it. Let's just surrender because we're going to die anyway. And he says something interesting. You don't think it's bad until it's brought up. He's like, well, you know what we'll do? We'll wait five days. If God bails us out in five days, okay, then we'll surrender. Enter Judas. And so she enters the scene in, in the eighth chapter. She's a beautiful woman, much like Esther, but she's a widow. She's been a widow for three years, but she's very religious. She fasts. She prays all the time. She lives like on the rooftop of her house, but beautiful. Big key here. She rebukes the elders. So what she's saying about this is that don't lay down conditions for God. And as she says this, it makes me stop. You ever do that? You ever lay down conditions for God? Like, like I'll do that if, da 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 da, da right? You know, or if this happens, you ever do that like game when you're a kid? Like, if I make this basket, I'll win lotto next week. You ever do that kind of thing? So, so you know, it's like that. She's pointing out how ridiculous this is. This is stupid. God can do whatever he wants. So interesting part of the story she tells him she has a plan, but she doesn't say what it is. We never know right here. Well, we, we do, but we don't know at this point. So what she does is she gets herself all dialed up. She's already a beautiful woman, but gets herself all dialed up. You know, she wears the right clothes and uh, gets everything done right. She leaves the city, and she tells the soldiers she, who approach her she's defecting and that she has a message for the king. Again, doesn't tell him what the message is. And it's, there's some comedy in here because they're basically like, oh, okay, they're awestruck. They say some, you know, like, yeah, sure, you know. But they say like, she said, and it's very comical because essentially, I'm paraphrasing, they say, this woman's so beautiful, we have to kill all these Jews because like, there's no way we're ever going to get any of them. They assume that these men are great too. Like, you know, we had to kill all of them, right? And so, but they're like, yeah, let's go see the king. So they send 100 men to take her to the king. Basically, a long story short, general is the same way. Or I keep saying king. Sorry, guys. To see the general. It's, it's not the king. <laughs> it's the general. So she goes and see him. Holofernes. Holofernes. She goes to see him. Same kind of thing. But now you still don't know what's going on. And you don't know the story. Here's what I'm going to do. She kind of says what Achior says. Like, basically, like, you can beat them if they sin. So I'm going to go out at night, basically, like, out of the camp, and I'm going to pray. And God's going to tell me when they sin. Then I'll let you know. Then you'll attack them and you'll destroy them. Why would she do that? You'll find out. So three days goes by. Fourth day, she, she, uh, there's a feast. He holds a feast, the general, not the king. The general holds this feast. <laughs> Again, the comedy. He drinks more than he's ever drank in his whole life. <laughs> right, so he's drunk. And again, comical statements. Bring Judas in here. If I said Esther during the story, I meant Judas. <laughs> I was reversing them when I was going over this before. Bring Judas in, right? I got it basically. He says, I got to have a crack at that, you know? <laughs> like, let me get a chance at being with her. Now, okay. Bring her in. He does what a lot of people who drink more than they ever have in their entire life do. He passes out. So she goes up to him. Short, quiet prayer to God, give me strength in this, grabs him by the hair, takes his own sword, whacks at his neck two times until his head comes off, puts it in the bag. She has a servant girl with her, and they go off, but they get away. Why? Because they've been doing that for three days. No one's wiser. Brings it back. Everybody celebrates. This is great. She's like, I got another plan. They're going to put his head on the wall, but then we're just going to go out and attack them, and here's what they're going to do. They're going to find their general beheaded. They're going to freak out, scatter. You'll attack him, kill him. That's what happens, and that's what goes down. The last few chapters, the 16 chapters long, are interesting because it ends with these, like, songs of victory recounting, like, these heroes of the story here, and it should remind you of Deborah. Like, so when you get to Judges 5, the song of Barak and Deborah, should remind you of that. And then there are things about this story that are very, very, very similar here, here to uh, like when Jael uses the tent pig to kill Sisera in the tent. So another woman killing a general. And indeed, that's a similarity here. There are also similarities to Esther and Judith that are quite obvious, and you can see why they traditionally were right next to one another there. But here's the thing. They're beautiful. They use it to their advantage, but they're both sacrificial. Remember Esther, key verse, if I must die, 
I must die. Judith, when she's going out, she makes a statement. The Lord will use me to rescue the people of Israel. She's putting herself in quite the spot. Just defecting in the first place is very dangerous. Of course, she has the advantage, right? But it's a dangerous thing. You're going to go into the enemy's general's tent. You're crazy right? with this plan that she had that she didn't tell anyone about. Sacrificial people, certainly the bravery and willingness to sacrifice themselves for others is like a common theme that we're getting here. Now, going back to like it not being in the Bible now, people ask me why. It's really not a long story. It's a short one. There was just a publishing company of a certain group of, I believe, the Scottish Protestants. They were like, nope, we're not printing this anymore because they just didn't like it. But if you go back through history, even Martin Luther said that these books are good to read. Right? So it's just weird. You know what I mean? Like they were in Luther's German translation as well. He had no problem with it. So it's just a very strange thing. In the mid-1800s, they just stopped printing them in the Bible. It just became like a thing. Monkey see, monkey do. That's it. So here's what they do. People try to explain why they don't know. And so they just make stuff up. <laughs> That's what's happened through the years. And it's really all the arguments against it, they're very silly. So I'll give you one proposed one. Deceit. So people say of Judas. She, dece she uses deceit to accomplish the goal. God would never let anyone do that. Okay. <laughs> Abraham. What does he say to Pharaoh? <laughs> right? This is my sister. It's half true. Gross. But yeah, this is my sister. So that he won't get killed because she's really, really beautiful. And then he does it again to Abimelech of Gerar. My sister. <laughs> it causes these people big problems. Deceit. Isaac does it too. Probably the same guy. Abimelech, king of Gerar. But he's totally lying. It's not, <laughs> Rebecca's not his sister. But that's what he does there. David. You know, Achish of Gath, he was scared. He pretends he's crazy to King Achish to get himself off the hook. Esther, imagine that. Like, it's kind of important that the king, your husband, knows what nationality you are, especially if you're making all these decrees. She doesn't tell him. I kind of call that deceit, right? You get married to someone, and there's like this whole really important thing about them that you don't know. Deceit. <laughs> there's deceit in that, too. Now, another proposed problem with Judith is that it is pretty obvious that it's a fictional work. And so, just like the original author, I left out some details. And both cases, they're important and they're on purpose. The author does this on purpose. It's kind of when you attribute things to other people or you make certain characters in the persona of a certain person. And so, he says it's Nebuchadnezzar, but then he keeps calling the army, uh, enemy army the Assyrians. And if you know anything, that's wrong. <laughs> no, you can answer Babylonians. And now if you read, you know, you just read the good stuff, good historical stuff, they'll say, clearly, this very, very best-selling book of all time, <laughs> the authors of this are not going to make mistakes that are so obvious. They're doing it like a wink. You know what I mean? This is not supposed to be real, right? It's in the personas. So it's the moral of the story here. And, and this is funny, and this gets me when certain Christians don't grasp this. Because this is the way Jesus teaches, right? Who's the prodigal son? What's his name? Nobody knows, right? The father, you don't know. They symbolize people. It's just a parable. The parable of the sower. We got to throw that out because we don't know his name. Jesus is not telling a real historical account. See the problem with that? Judith. It's not supposed to. You're supposed to get a moral of the story here. And so there, that's in the Bible all over the place. So it's another bad argument. And a lot of people don't know. We're not going to stay here too long. But it's also said of Esther. And so it's worth noting if you read like rabbinic commentaries, uh, the rabbis didn't usually put Esther in the historical section. They put it in the wisdom section. And when you look at your Bible the way if you're in America, you might see it. Esther would be here, then Job would start. But the way a rabbi might see it, and so this is history, this is the beginning of the poetry section. A rabbi might go, poetry section, that's just one book off. So it's the way we perceive these things. Uh, it was very well known that there is no histor historical record of a Queen Esther. So uh, a lot of people put it there. Believe what you will about it. Another proposed problem, and this is interesting. So here we're going to get really interesting. For Esther, is that the book of Esther is one of only two books of the shortest canon of the Bible, or any canon of the Bible, two books that don't mention God once. Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, and Esther. Not one mention of God, not even like the Lord. Nothing. 
No mention, no suggestion about God. It's not in there one time. Unless you're reading the Bible of the early church. Greek Esther. If you read Greek Esther, they're going to talk about it a lot. It begins with Mordecai's dream. He has like this vision or dream. It mentions God. After the whole, if I die, I die. There. We get extra prayers. Mordecai's prayer. Esther's prayer. Mention God. Mention God. The scene of Esther coming into like the king's court. More dramatic. Gives us a little inf more information. It says she faints. Not once, but twice. She thinks she's going to die. So it really drives that, that verse home, right? If I must die, I must die. She's like passing out. She's so scared. And then it gives her an advantage, right? The king feels sorry for her. It's a beautiful woman passed out. She's like, oh. So it's this uh, much more dramatic kind of scene here. And it gives us a little bit more emotion behind what Esther must be going through. You put yourself there. All of these sections mention God. And for example, during that little short snippet I told you about, the plot uh, to kill the king where Mordecai stops it, this is Greek Esther 2.20. Esther still wasn't telling anyone her family background and race. As Mordecai had ordered her, she continued to worship God and obey God's commands just as when she was in his care. Esther didn't change the way she lived. Another really interesting thing is Greek Esther ends with a postscript that's kind of important. Instead of glorifying Xerxes and Mordecai, Mordecai glorifies God. And the short section of this paragraph mentions God no less than five times. God, God, over and over again. Now, the irony here of the absence of God in this book is that it misses the whole point. What's the point here? What are we taking away? We must trust in God no matter how difficult the circumstance may seem. <laughs> Ultimately, what that means is, ultimately, our eternal good. That's ultimately what it means. That's the takeaway here. We must not be short-sighted trusting in this life alone. If I must die, I must die. That's faith. It's trusting that we know where we're going when that happens. True faith. So no matter how bad these battles may seem in our lives, right? how powerful these worldly forces that come at us are, even in suffering, we must trust, we must have faith in where we're going. That's the perspective. And then he continues to work out everything for the good of those who love him. What does that make you think of? Romans 8, 28. <clears throat> True. But in Romans 8, we find another verse of the day problem. If you just look at this singularly, just all by itself, and you don't know Romans really well, you may be tempted to look at it and say, okay, and we know that God causes what? Everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Look at that by itself, you may think, great. Right? So I'm going to pray that. I'm going to look at the verse of the day. Put that away now. Forget about the Bible and God. And I'm just going to go out. I'm going to get the new job. I'm going to get the new car. I'm going to get lots of money because God's going to work out. It, it says everything. Everything. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. Can't be wrong. Everything. So my life should be absolutely perfect because I love Him. And people, there are people who subscribe to that. And then what happens? It doesn't go well. Uh-oh, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> not reading Job like that. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not going perfectly for me. What's wrong? Well, they're going to come to one of two conclusions. Either my faith isn't good, I don't have enough faith, I don't really love God, or there's no such thing as God. That's why that's bad. You're like, what's the big deal, Pastor Jay? It's a very big deal. People lose their faith. They lose their faith. It's no good. All because they didn't know the context. And that's what I want to show you here. This might shock some people. We're going to look at it. I'm not going to read all of Romans 8, but we'll get through it, and then I'll close. Romans 8, a lot of people don't understand why Romans was written. Romans was not written. Paul did not sit down pridefully and say, let me write the greatest theological work that was ever made. No. 
There's disunity in the church. If you read Acts 18, you know, some of the Jews are kicked out. I remember Claudius, then when he's gone, they're allowed to come back in. But in the meantime, the Gentiles are running the church, and it becomes like a very non-Jewish thing. But Christianity, Jesus is Jewish. It's a very Jewish thing in the beginning, and so they're fighting. And so, Romans 1, the Gentiles have sinned. We have these two groups. Romans 2, you too, Jews, if you're so good, teach yourself. The Jews have sinned. Three, level playing field. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Four, Abraham's faith. You're saved by faith. Not all these little works you're doing, so stop it. It doesn't matter. Do good, but the law's not bad, but just quit bragging about it, right? So five through seven, Adam and Christ contrasted. That's what that's all about, and it's leading us into eight. Six, we're no longer slaves to sin. You're not bound by that. You're not obligated to sin. And here in eight, you're not obligated. Uh, sorry. You're not, you're, yeah, you're not bound to sin. You're not obligated to it. You're saved by the power of the Spirit. And so it's all about suffering, living sacrificially by the power of the Spirit, Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So don't stop reading it, Romans 7. Bad idea. All right? You are not under the obligation to follow your sinful nature. That's a point here. So if we hop a little bit, Romans 8.15, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal to his children, reveal who his children really are. If we jump a little, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father knows all hearts who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Looks a little different now, doesn't it? It's all for our good, but not now. Now, we must suffer for Christ. That's interesting. He says a little bit more about it. Romans 8.35, can anything ever separate us from God's love in Christ? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are being killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. Not the verse of the day, ever. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us and convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. That's the point. It's our future good. Nothing here is good, right? So no matter what we're going through, we're looking for that future victory in Jesus. That's it. It can be really bad, but no, nothing is better than that. And God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us. Think about that. Reflect on that when you think your life is hard. That's the point. And here's the thing. So 9 through 11 of Romans, Paul's addressing his kinsmen. That's really what that's all about. Those are Jewish people. What happens to the ones that didn't accept Jesus? That's the overlying context. We get to Romans 12. This is this. And so, or therefore, brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is how you worship him. Jesus sacrificed himself for us, and in turn, he expects us to live sacrificially. 
be like Jesus. It says it all over the New Testament. And what we learn from Esther's example, if I must die, I must die, is sacrificial living. It's true faith. And by living that way, I'm not saying we go out and try to get ourselves killed. <laughs> and just is worth noting, in the early church, some people had so much faith, they knew what I'm going to talk about next, that they would actually, it was a problem. They were trying to get themselves like put into the Colosseum games so that they would get beheaded or killed for Jesus because that meant something significant that I'll talk about in a minute. But on that note, that's not what I'm saying. Esther doesn't die. And that may work out for us too. Not everything we do. It's just living sacrificially for one another. It could be very small things, but just putting people ahead of yourselves. That's it, right? So it could be traffic in Naples. If you've got a Jesus fish in your car, let the person in the line, right? You know, stop doing this to me, <laughs> you know? And the answer is, is not just take the Jesus fish off your car. No, you know, like, well, so I'm not going to be a Christian, right? So this is guaranteeing that I'm going to do the wrong thing. No, but right, just simple things, right? Start there. Tip, you, the service was bad, so it's my job to enact justice on this waiter or waitress whose husband could have left her. You know what I mean? You don't know. Have mercy. God had mercy on you. Have grace. God has grace over you. None of us deserves any of this. And so, the waiter or waitress, tip them more. That's what I do. Tip them. They probably need a pick-me-up. Start thinking that, that's what this means. That's what Romans 12 means. That's worship. You, anybody can come in here and sing a bunch of lies. That's not worship. It is worship, it's a, but it's an extension of Romans 12. If you weren't doing Romans 12, it's just singing. That's all that is. If you were doing Romans 12, that's worship. That's the way it works. That's what the Bible says all over the place. Isaiah 1, Amos 5, Peter talks about it. Take away the noise of your songs if you're not living sacrificially. That's the point. So this is what we should be learning from that. But here's the thing, guys. I want to show you a little something, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. <laughs> it doesn't always mean we die, but no one can escape that. No one can escape that. You cannot. We, we're all going to die. I used to end staff meetings that way. We're all going to die. Just remember that. Change is the way you live, though, and if you think you may die at any minute. So live sac. That's what that means. Live knowing you are going to die. You cannot delay it. So let's just take a look at something. I want to give you some real biblical encouragement this morning. So we see something similar. I talked about Mark 6 yesterday. So I gave you the layout of the chapter there. It's kind of moving quick. Jesus is rejected in his own hometown. He sends the disciples. And then I showed you that they come back. And we, we looked at that. But in the meantime, Mark is telling a good story here. And so what he does is the disciples are away. It's really neat. He kind of recalls the fate of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist... He's the Messiah's herald, if you know about him, right? He baptized Jesus, and he paved the way. I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness. So Isaiah 41, Malachi 31. So he's that guy. But he's a preacher. He's a good preacher, and he's a really hard preacher. You think I'm bad? Forget about it. You brood vipers, you know? Like, he's really bad. You're right? Repent. So he's real bad. And so what he's doing is he's telling King Herod, the Tetrarch, he's like this client king there. He's telling King Herod that he can't be with his brother's wife. <laughs> the guy's with his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. You can't do that. It's no good. It's bad. You shouldn't do that. So he's going at him. The king is kind of a fan. The wife, not so much. So here's what happens. Mark 6.21, Herodias' chance finally came on Herod's birthday. He gave a party for his high government officials, army officers, and the leading citizens of Galilee. Then his daughter, Herodias herself, came and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guests. Ask me for anything you like, the king said to the girl, and I will give it to you. He even vowed, I will give you whatever you ask, up to half my kingdom. She went out and asked her mother, what should I ask for? Her mother told her, ask for the head of John the Baptist. Sound familiar? Up to half my kingdom. Well, John gets his head cut off. So gross story. Rather than, no, it's not a silver platter, but a platter. Head on a platter. Here you go. What do we learn? John is killed for being in keeping with God's commands. 
John is killed for preaching the truth. John is killed for preaching the truth. But where's John's comfort? Here's the thing. Jesus says this may happen to us too. What are the prerequisites for baptism? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. What does that mean? You may get killed for this. He gives really stern warnings. What general with only 10,000 men would go out against another general with 20? For he calculates the cost. It ain't anything like the way we're doing it today. Hey, let's just go to the water park. Yay! Never turning back. You know, you get like a t-shirt and everything. That happens. What? <laughs> so here's the thing. This is what the early Christians will, will look at. We've looked at this in the series. We must believe that we will achieve victory. We achieve victory by finishing strong. And if you read it to the end, that's what it says. And you'll notice something if you're reading it. This group of people that has been beheaded, specifically, you might say martyred in your version. They got their heads cut off like John the Baptist, chopped. What happens? Well, Jesus has to comfort them. They, they, they kind of come up and say, Jesus, what are you going to do? Relax, I'll give you white robes in the meantime. But what we see happens is there are two resurrections. The one specifically that were martyred for the faith they get to rise up first and reign with Jesus first, judging all the nations. There's a first resurrection and a second one. If you're reading it literally, 1,000 years. If you get your head chopped off for Jesus and you believe the word of God, if you really believe it, well, you take comfort in knowing that you'll get to reign with Jesus for 1,000 years. Sounds pretty cool. And so the people of the faith that had probably none of the distractions we do, they held on to this. They believed this. And so should we. No matter how bad it gets, check this out, Revelation 3.1. We'll be on the throne, right, like Esther. Revelation 3.21. Those who are victorious, that means finishing strong to the end, will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious. How? i being crucified and sat with my father on his throne. See, we see a prefigure of reward for sacrifice in Esther. It's all prefiguring, pointing to Jesus. Esther gives us a foreshadowing of the reward for self-sacrifice that we will achieve in Christ upon his return. This is our faith. We must trust that God will raise us to a new life in Christ when he returns. We should expect this world to be as evil as it is and not put our trust here. It's all in heaven. Knowing that what happens in this life is not the end. We'll have good times. We'll have bad times. But none of it lasts forever. That's only in Jesus. We must have faith. We must follow his example of sacrificial living then we will be seated with him on the throne. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church that is the body of Christ. Let them be encouraged by this. We are just passing through. We are just sojourning. We are just aliens and foreigners here. We are citizens of heaven. Let us take that to heart as we go out this week and remember that we are representatives of our King Jesus. And as such, we must show others the grace, the mercy, the kindness, the peace, and the love that you, Lord, have shown to us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you.